Welcome everyone, and it's a pleasure to welcome today uh, Audrey Turco, who's a professor of psychiatry at Brown University. She's also director of the Clinical Translational Neuroscience Laboratory at the Butler Hospital. Uh, she was trained at University of Pennsylvania, my old alma mater, and uh, went on from there to uh, Brown and has been continuously funded for over 15 years, examining the relationships between early life adversity and early trauma and mental health disorders and aggressive disorders. Uh, she's done really remarkable work looking at the biological aging processes associated with that early trauma. So it's really a pleasure today to welcome her here to UCLA, I think for the first time. Yes. So uh, evaluating childhood adversity and cellular aging, effects on telomeres and mitochondrial function. So I think, thanks. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thanks so much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, it is my first time, and it's wonderful to be here at the Cousin Center among uh, such like-minded colleagues doing important work for the field and, and for our patients. Uh, these are disclosures relevant to some neuromodulation work that I do, nothing relevant to the talk I'll be uh, presenting today. So today I'm going to be talking about childhood adversity, uh, both childhood maltreatment like abuse and neglect, uh, as well as other kinds of adversities, childhood parental loss, uh, socioeconomic adversity, and, and other kinds of experiences. And um, I, I really, I developed my interest in this area uh, really starting as a resident in psychiatry, working with inpatients who you know, we're in the hospital for suicide, suicide attempt, or depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder, and the like. But I really noticed that most of them, I'd say probably about 90% of them on the inpatient unit, on the general inpatient unit, had had a history of severe childhood adversity. Childhood abuse, neglect, you know, other forms of problems. Oftentimes they had parental mental illness. Oftentimes they had poverty and grew up in difficult <coughs> neighborhoods and environments. And so, you know, I pondered over the relationship between those two, of course, and also was really struck by the fact that not only did these folks often have comorbid psychiatric disorders. Are you, are you is her microphone? No, your microphone's this this is the microphone I was told that I should yeah, be speaking into, but if I do that, I'll be hunched over. Can you? Can I could. How about this? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is like, all right. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Um, so, along with psychiatric comorbidities, you know, people often will have depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I was struck by the fact that they often had a whole host of medical comorbidities like diabetes and obesity and hypertension and dyslipidemia, you know, the metabolic syndrome, um, and also chronic pain and asthma. So um, that really sparked my interest in this area in understanding the biological processes that are underpinnings for these uh, comorbid relationships. Now, uh, imagine everybody knows about the ACEs study here at Kaiser Permanente in the, in the 70s. Uh, over a thousand subjects were queried adult patients in the Kaiser Permanente system about their experience of childhood adversities, uh, both maltreatment experiences as well as dysfunction in the household. And over the years, there have been many publications coming out of that study showing a variety of effects. Today, I'll be talking about biological effects mostly, but I wanted to point out psychosocial and health risk behaviors that go along with those experiences of childhood adversity. And I mentioned some of that in relation to psychiatric patients. Um, certainly it's the case that if you grow up with a you know, neglectful or abusing parent, it can be very difficult for you to develop healthy, positive social attachments um, and a healthy sense of yourself. Um, certainly it's the case that these environments um, predispose people to other behaviors that put, put them at risk for the same kinds of uh, biological effects and phenotypic outcomes. Um, a lot of, I just want to sort of as a way of introduction say that in a lot of our adult work, 
so adults with a history of childhood adversity, we've tried to isolate the effects of childhood adversity by excluding people who had uh, confounding influences like medication use, for example, or like diabetes or other kind of active medical problems that could confound the relationship between childhood adversity and say the HPA axis or immune function or other, other aspects of biology that we were looking at. Now of course if you do that, what that means is that some of the people you'll be studying will be at risk to develop those disorders, which is what we're aiming for, but some of them may be resilient, right? And, and you know, we used to think about resilience as, you know, as a sort of unitary factor, but now, of course, we understand, or at least the way I, I think about uh, resilience, is that we are all at risk and resilient for every condition we haven't gotten yet, right? Because they're multifactorial. Everything, you know, the things that we're interested in are, are multifactorial. So we have some of the risk factors and some of the resilience factors. And so it can be very difficult to tease these things apart. Um, the other thing I would say is that we also study children. And so by and large, if, they, if they're very young children and they haven't developed the disorder yet, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we're selecting those who are resilient, right? So that's, that's something to think about. And then a lot of other studies in this area do, are epidemiologic studies that take all comers. And so studies of adults that often have people with the metabolic syndrome, with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease, often on medications. And so then they will statistically control for those factors um, and you know sort of pull out the variance associated with these other some of these other risk factors uh, also uh, I didn't say they'll the statistically control for these measures as well um, and that's that's a good approach to see if you can isolate the effects of child adversity but to the extent that that shared variance is really intertwined and part and parcel of the process that's going on, if you pull out the variance due to these other behaviors, you may be uh, unnecessarily or inappropriately taking variance away from your variable of interest. So that's all to say this is a tricky area and you can be thinking about some of those processes as I present you with some data. And long-term consequences. I'm going to start over here. Certainly I've seen this in a lot of the inpatients that I've worked with. I worked on a uh, Medicaid unit for a long time. And, um, you know, the patients came in, they were oftentimes homeless, oftentimes they had schizoaffective disorder, so they were hearing voices, and depressed, and suicidal, and on drugs, and with chronic pain, and they had been abused. You know, trying to find your way through that and you know my frequent refrain to those folks was it's remarkable that you are still standing you're here and that that suggests that that you're really resilient just to make it through um, and again uh, the medical outcomes that are often result from from this picture of adversity and uh, health behaviors this is a, uh, an overview of the kinds of things that our lab is interested in and has studied over the years. Um, early stress, obviously. I'm going to touch a little bit on epigenetics today, HPA axis function, teeny bit on inflammation, and I'm mostly going to focus on cellular aging measures, telomere shortening, and also I'm going to be talking about mitochondria. Okay. So I'm going to start with this endophenotype study. This was a study that was started uh, by Linda Carpenter, a colleague of mine at Brown, uh, 10, or more, 10 or 12 years ago. And we added some additional studies to it over time with similar methodology. Um, and we've published uh, quite a bit over the years with subsamples, you know, originally with a small number of subjects and now more recently with uh, about 400 participants. Um, these are healthy adults age 18 to 65, so they did not have current medications that would interfere with our measures of HPA axis function. Uh, many of them did not have a current psychiatric disorder, although some of the later work that I'll show you does have some people who have either current or past psychiatric disorders. Uh, they didn't have any major recent stressors, uh, illnesses, and they weren't shift workers, so that we could really understand what was going on in terms of basal function of HPA axis and, and other uh, systems. 
uh, no lifetime chronic medical conditions, major head injury, seizure, uh, endocrine conditions, etc. We assessed uh, childhood maltreatment. Uh, much of the work I'll show you is based on the CTQ, the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire. Uh, and we also assessed and recruited specifically for parental loss. So adults with a history of childhood parental death before the age of 18, or parental desertion, where they did not have any contact with a parent for a period of six months or more. Uh, and that was done via semi-structured interview. We did a skid, uh, axis one and axis two, although uh, we did not have very many who coded on axis two and I will not be presenting the results of that today. And then we did standardized neuroendocrine challenge tasks, uh, the DEX-CRH test, where dexamethasone is given the night before the test to kind of suppress the HPA axis, and then the subjects come in the next day, an IV is placed, uh, basal levels of blood are drawn for cortisol, ACTH assay, and then a bolus of CRH is given at 3 p.m. to drive the system, and then blood samples are taken throughout. Uh, and also the TSST. Are people familiar with the TSST? Yeah. It's a standardized psychosocial stress test with a mock job interview and a, a uh, serial uh, subtraction task. And then uh, we had blood samples and we isolated leukocyte DNA and we've looked at uh, certain candidate genes and gene methylation, telomere length, and I'm going to be telling you about mitochondrial DNA as well. So here are some of the first findings from that study. Um, I'm sorry, the ends are kind of small, but it's about 25 per group. The, both the ends and the type are kind of small. <laughs> uh, this is healthy adults with a history of childhood maltreatment. Uh, and what you can see here, and it's in the TRIER social stress test, what you can see is plasma ACTH and plasma cortisol. Those in red had a history of childhood maltreatment, so there were attenuated ACTH and cortisol responses to this test. Now this stood in contrast with some work at the time that had been published by Christine Heim's group showing elevated cortisol responses to this task. And over the years, uh, as you all probably know, um, there have been some studies that show elevated levels of cortisol in association with stress, stress, others that show attenuated. There certainly have been several studies, several other lab groups that have replicated these findings. Uh, but in other cases, is cortisol is sometimes higher in association with early stress. Um, we've tried to tease apart what some of the factors might be, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But uh, generally, based on animal work and human work, it's thought that a variety of characteristics of the stressor are important, that the type and the timing and the nature, the severity of the stressor may really have an impact. And it may be that initially you get an exaggerated cortisol response to stress and then a down regulation of the response later on, probably in response to epigenetic factors uh, modifying that uh, response. Here we have, uh, again in this study, healthy adults. Uh, this is the response to the DEX-CRH test. This is cortisol response in both cases. These are all subjects and it's about, uh, mm, sorry, it's about, oh, I think it's 100 subjects here. Um, and then this is the older cohort, age 36 to 61. And what you can see is lower cortisol responses in those, in this case with emotional abuse, uh, that were magnified when you look just at the older subjects, uh, perhaps suggesting an increased response over time. So here we looked at childhood parental loss um, and, and the cortisol response to the DEX-CRH test. And we had a control group that had no parental loss and then a death, parental death group in red and a desertion group in green. And what you can see is that we had an elevated cortisol response to the DEX-CRH test in those with a history of childhood parental loss. Again, these are healthy adults. They have no other medical conditions, nothing else going on. But we asked ourselves, well, gee, does it matter what the quality of the parental relationship is? And you know, certainly there are people who survive the loss of a parent and have adequate nurturing from existing caregivers or surviving caregivers. So we looked at levels of parental care on the PBI, the parental bonding instrument. 
And what we found, well, here are the controls again, and what we found was that those with parental desertion and low levels of parental care had this attenuated response to stress. Again, suggesting that the type and severity of the adversity may have this attenuating response on the HPA axis. Okay. So, um, we were interested in looking at regulation of the glucocorticoid receptor because, as I'm sure you know, the glucocorticoid receptor has a uh, function where it feeds back negatively to shut down the HPA axis. And, of course, Michael Meany and his colleagues, as well as some other groups, have looked at this. In general, in animal studies, they have found higher levels of methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor, certainly Michael Meany's work, higher levels of methylation uh, associated with reduced gene expression. So you have a reduction in the feedback to the HPA axis, and in fact, higher levels of corticosterone to stress exposures in, in rodents. Some human studies have also shown higher levels of methylation, but as you might expect, given what I said before about cortisol levels sometimes being higher or lower, and the regulation of this gene being so important to that, um, you, you might ask the question, would you expect to see higher or lower levels of methylation in, in this gene in relation to early trauma? Um, and so we've recently published on a relatively large group of subjects, 340 subjects, uh, those with no history of stress-related disorders. So this is the endophenotype study, and the types of disorders that people had were depressive disorders, um, anxiety disorders, or past substance use disorders. So we conceived of those as stress-related disorders. Of course, other disorders are also stress-related, but these are the uh, ones that we were most interested in. Nobody had a current active substance use disorder because that would interfere with our testing. So that was one thing that's different about those, those groups. Um, so these are the sort of controls, the, 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 uh, con they're controls on both factors, right? No disorder and no early adversity. Then in red, uh, we have subjects with no history of psychiatric disorder, uh, but who do have a history of childhood adversity, and that's either childhood maltreatment, abuse or neglect, or childhood parental loss. Then in green, we have those with a history of a disorder, but no adversity. And in purple, both a disorder and adversity. And here we have 13 uh, CPG sites that were originally studied on the first study of methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor by uh, Oberlander and colleagues. And what you can see is that we have significant effects, um, uh, methylation of a variety of CPGs, uh, and the effects are in the negative direction, right? So reduced levels of methylation. Uh, and by and large, it doesn't matter much which group you're in, um, if you have adversity or a history of psychopathology or both. And here we looked at the relationship between cortisol to the, in the DEX-CRH test in a subsample of these participants. And I don't know how well you can see that, but if you looked overall at the mean across these CPG sites, um, there was a positive correlation with the post-dexamethasone cortisol value uh, and a trend for the area under the curve to be associated with methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor. And then if you look at a variety of CPG sites, there were some significant effects throughout suggesting a positive association, which is what you would expect based on the animal work, that in, in our case, it's lower levels of methylation, presumably higher receptor expression, presumably enhanced feedback of the HPA axis, and therefore lower levels of cortisol. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the gene expression uh, work in this sample that we'd like to have to be able to, uh, to show all those steps. Okay, now here's a, um, a subsample, actually the, the original sub smaller sample that I showed you with the, uh, this is data I already showed you with the cortisol response, the TSST suppressed in those with childhood adversity. We also in the same subjects looked at plasma IL-6 in the TSST and found that those with abuse had higher responses, uh, IL-6 responses in the TSST. And here, switching gears a bit, we're interested in the metabolic syndrome. So I mentioned earlier that 
people with adversity and, and psychiatric patients very commonly have this cluster of uh, abnormalities. Now these are healthy adults. So I told you none of our people had a diagnosis or medication uh, uh, that related to these conditions. But we looked at their values on these various metabolic syndrome factors and looked at established cutoffs and determined whether our participants had any, you know, were elevated on any of these various subclinical indices of the metabolic syndrome and compared that to their cortisol response to the DEX-CRH. And what we found, indeed, was that those who had low levels of cortisol to the DEX-CRH had higher BMI, greater trunk diameter and waist-to-hip ratio, uh, higher systolic blood pressure, and higher uh, ALT uh, in the liver function test. And indeed, when you looked at those who had 0, 1, 2, or 3 of these subclinical indices of the metabolic syndrome, what you saw was a stepwise decrement in the cortisol response to the DEX-CRH test. Okay, so this slide is just uh, moving us into talking about telomeres. Um, and this is a slide from Alyssa Eppel uh, showing some of the uh, biological mediators of uh, telomere dysfunction, including uh, elevations in cortisol and insulin, cytokines, and oxidative stress. Everybody here know about telomeres, I imagine? Uh, telomeres have been likened to this thing. Anybody know what that's called? Close. Aglet. Did you say a gimlet? That's yeah. a that's a gin drink. <laughs> I used to be a bartender in a former life. So, so the idea here is that this cap kind of protects the shoelace from becoming frayed. And uh, something of the same could be said about telomeres. It's a, an end cap on the chromosome that protects the, the DNA. So as I'm sure you know, telomeres shorten with each cell division. When the telomere becomes critically short, the chromosome is vulnerable. And so to protect the, uh, the coding genes from damage, the cell becomes senescent or undergoes apoptosis. Uh, there's this enzyme telomerase that adds base pairs back onto the telomeres, but it's not very active in most tissues. And as I'm sure you know, high telomerase is found in immortal cancer cells. So here's just a schematic of that with these telomere ends. When cells divide, each time they divide, the telomeres shorten a bit. And you can see here, now, as I age, I start to think, this is really not fair. I mean, come on. Uh, so I need to redraw this uh, because it's not quite that dramatic. Although, um, as you may have heard about in other talks, there is this interesting factor where um, people, the, ver the older old, um, there may be better terms for that, uh, have longer telomeres, and that's probably a selection bias, right? So that if you live longer, you have longer telomeres, and then you start to have telomere decline later in life as you get into the 80s and 90s. Okay, so uh, telomere shortening has been associated with a whole variety of medical conditions and psychiatric conditions, really. Uh, most of the ones I told you about in the beginning that, that you very commonly see in psychiatric patients and in those with a history of childhood adversity. Depression, PTSD, substance use disorders, hypertension, diabetes, migraine, cardiovascular disease, obesity, cancer, stroke, and others. Now this is a meta-analysis you can't possibly see all of the data, but it's uh, by uh, Dr. Rideout and uh, colleagues in our laboratory. Uh, we published this in the Journal of Affective Disorders last year, um, looking at the relationship between major depression and telomere shortening. And I'll cut to the chase. We found a modest but significant overall effect of major depression uh, with shorter telomeres. <laughs> So what shortens telomeres? Uh, well, we've known for many, many decades that things like cigarette smoke, radiation, pollution shorten telomeres. And in recent years, um, now it's more like 15 years, um, 10 or 15 years, we also know that psychosocial stress results in sh telomere shortening. Mm -hmm. 
And this really started with Alyssa Eppel's uh, publication in 2004 looking at uh, caregivers, mothers of children with a disability. And she found that chronicity of caregiving was linked to telomere length, such that, and that, that reported stress in relation to caregiving um, resulted in lower uh, average telomere length and also lower levels of telomerase. So some years later, our group decided to look at this in a very small sample of the endophenotype study. Adults without any uh, current or, or past major medical conditions and without any psychiatric disorders who had a history of early stress. Ten subjects here only, uh, but we found lower uh, telomere length, shorter telomere length in those subjects with a history of early stress. Recently, we have um, looked at this again in a much larger sample from the endophenotype study. Uh, it did not include those prior subjects, so it's an independent study. And um, this is organized according to the same way that I showed you for the methylation uh, study. So here we have no adversity and no disorder, adversity and no disorder, yes disorder, no adversity, and both. And this is telomere length on the y-axis. And what you can see is that although uh, those with adversity and no disorder had shorter telomeres, this was not, did not reach significance, uh, those with a history of a stress-related disorder with or without adversity had significantly shorter telomeres. Now, you know, this is an odd way I mean, we thought it made sense to separate them out this way, but most people don't look at it this way. Most people look just at, say this, just at what is the effect of childhood adversity on telomere shortening, irrespective of diagnostic category. And what you see here is that both parental loss and a history of maltreatment were significantly associated with telomere shortening. And conversely, if you look at the dif disorders, irrespective of childhood adversity, you see that uh, depression, depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, PTSD were all significantly associated with shorter telomeres. Past substance abuse did not, um, did n was not significant. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that is, uh, but it is notable that this is past substance abuse. In some cases, these were adults that had, you know, long ago history of alcohol abuse in college. We tried not to be, we tried not to be too conservative about that, but uh, nevertheless, um, that may really be a different group than uh, what we what we ordinarily think of. And uh, we've just now published in Molecular Psychiatry, uh, Dr. Rideout and uh, other colleagues in our group, uh, meta-analysis of early life stress associated with shortened telomeres. And again, a, a relatively modest but significant overall effect showing shorter telomeres in association with early life stress. Okay, so moving on to mitochondria. Uh, we became interested in mitochondria because they're co-regulated with telomeres and because they're involved in cellular aging and cell death. Um, people, I'm sure, have learned about mitochondria in high school. You learn that they are the powerhouse of the cell, right? So mitochondria produce the energy that your cells need to live and survive and function. Um, because of that, they're intimately involved in the stress response because your cells need energy and your body needs energy for, to respond to stressors. Uh, but also mitochondria are critically involved in calcium signaling. Uh, they regulate immune function, regulate telomere length, and so um, they're involved in a whole host of cellular processes that we are very interested in. Now I want to point out here um, that uh, malfunction in mitochondria, if they're not functioning well, um, can lead to a compensatory response in the number of mitochondria and in the number of mitochondrial DNA copies. So like with the HPA axis and many of the other systems we look at, uh, sometimes decrements are bad, sometimes elevations are good, and sometimes it's the opposite. So um, this is just a prelude to showing you some of our data. Um, much of the data on aging and mitochondrial DNA copy number, which is a, a proxy for, um, you know, sort of how, how much, how many mitochondria are there and how much DNA is there in the mitochondria. Um, that with aging, um, you often see a 
decrease in mitochondrial DNA copy number. However, as I said, depending on the condition, you can see a compensatory proliferation effect, and that is what we see, uh, not in this slide though. So I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, so this is a slide from Martin Picard and Bruce McEwen, where they revised Bruce McEwen's allostatic load hypothesis to really make uh, mitochondria central to this hypothesis. And they start out by talking about effects of chronic stress, uh, behavioral effects of inactivity and overeating, uh, effects of elevated levels of glucocorticoids and catecholamines, with attendant insulin resistance and high levels of blood glucose. This results in damage to the mitochondria, so you get fragmentation of the mitochondria, and when the mitochondria are under this kind of metabolic stress, you get more uh, reactive oxygen species production. So increases in ROS, which damage the mitochondrial DNA. And ROS also damage telomeres, or shorten telomeres. Uh, so that's, that's the oxidative stress that we're talking about here. You also get a systemic inflammatory process, uh, and that leads to cellular dysfunction, to telomere shortening, and also a variety of effects on the nuclear genome. Okay, I guess maybe I didn't I explain this uh, adequately. Um, mitochondria have their own DNA. It's a cir circular DNA with 37 genes. 13 of them are protein coding. And those 13 genes um, are critical to the mitochondrial respiratory chain, which is that process that takes the food that you eat and the oxygen that you breathe and turns it into energy. Okay, so that's really what the mitochondrial respiration process is doing. Um, but then there are many, many thousands of genes in the nuclear genome that regulate mitochondrial function. Okay, and each can regulate each other. And here, what Picard and McEwen are highlighting is that mitochondria and mitochondrial dysfunction from stress can actually alter epigenetic processes in the nuclear genome that then regulate mitochondria and telomeres and a variety of other stress-related processes. And this all leads to basically organ and systems dysfunction and the medical conditions that we started out talking about. So this is the telomere results that I showed you a moment ago. And I just wanted to remind you of what they look like before showing you the mitochondrial uh, DNA copy number in the same subjects. So rather than a decrease, as we saw with telomeres, um, we see an increase in mtDNA copy number in those with adversity and in those with disorders. And when you break it down, again, it's kind of the opposite pattern. Which is interesting because, as I told you, mitochondria and, and uh, telomeres are co-regulated. And in fact, when you look just at the relationship between mitochondrial DNA copy number and telomere length, there's a positive association, and other groups have reported this as well, somewhere around point R of 0.3. Okay, so they're positively related, and yet the association with stress that we're seeing is the opposite. And actually, these, these effects control for the effect of the relationship between mtDNA copy number and telomere length. So, if, and if you don't control for that, the effects are a, a bit diminished. Similar, but a bit diminished. And once again, looking at the effects on particular disorders, you see higher levels of mtDNA copy number. Okay. So, it turns out the glucocorticoid receptor regulates mitochondria. And it does so by uh, bound when it's bound to cortisol, it enters the nucleus and binds to glucocorticoid response elements in the nuclear genome. And it also binds to the mitochondrial genome. And in both places, regulates mitochondrial biogenesis and function. So we were interested in whether this relationship I just showed you between adversity and mitochondrial DNA copy number uh, which, in this case, I, I actually have added some subjects, so we have about 400 subjects here. So here's the effect in this group of subjects. Um, we asked the question whether this is mediated by glucocorticoid receptor methylation. And we have a significant relationship, as I showed you previously in a different form, uh, between adversity and methylation. 
a significant relationship between methylation and mtDNA copy number. And in fact, this didn't mediate the effect such that when you account for the effect of methylation, this effect drops to non-significant. And the indirect effect with uh, methylation is significant. Okay, how am I doing on time here? I have about tw 20 minutes, or we need some time for questions, I guess. I'll try to speed up a little bit. So this is a uh, study that was published around the same time, a group working on this uh, about the same time that we were, Kai and colleagues, a whole bunch of authors, you'll see, they did a lot of very interesting work. I'm only gonna present a little bit of the data. Um, Two of this study, two, uh, they looked at two studies. One is the Converge study, which had 11,680 participants with and without major depressive disorder. They were women and they had salivary DNA, okay? Then they also looked at the GenDep study, that was 216 men and women with uh, leukocyte DNA. And in blue are the controls, and in green and red are the MDD groups. And this is telomere shortening. Uh, the GenDep study, they didn't have that, but here they have telomeres in the Converge study. And this is a significant effect uh, with those with depression having shorter telomeres. And they looked at mtDNA copy number here as well. Those with depression had higher mtDNA copy number. And in the GenDep Gen study, mtDNA copy number uh, effect was examined and replicated. So that's both in saliva. Now we had looked previously in PBMC, uh, I'm sorry, in leukocytes. Uh, this is in saliva and this is in leukocytes as well. They also in the Converge study looked at the effects of early adversity on telomeres and on uh, mtDNA copy number. And they found shorter saliva telomere length in, associated in association with traumatic life events. I think they had 16 traumatic life events, not just in childhood, but throughout the lifespan. And they also looked at childhood sexual abuse and found a significant effect on shorter telomeres. And also significant effects on higher mtDNA copy number. And these effects were larger, as you can see, traumatic life events and childhood sexual abuse. Now, when they asked the question, is this dependent on having a diagnosis of MDD? And indeed they found when they controlled for the effect of major depressive disorder, the effects were no longer significant. Now, we talked a little bit before about pulling out significant variants, so there may be an issue there, and, and also an issue of the remaining participants who didn't have MDD, you may have a mixture of risk and resilience, as we talked about before, and so that's maybe why that's not significant. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about a little bit of work that our group has just started to do in collaboration with Kevin Bath at Brown, um, using a mouse model to look at hippocampal mitochondrial gene expression. So this model is uh, called, uh, it, it involves limited nesting resources. So the moms in the early life stress group get only a little bit of nesting material, and that results in what uh, we call fragmented maternal care. So it, this occurs during a discrete period in postnatal day four through postnatal day 11, and it is, alters the frequency and duration of the interactions between the mother and the pup much like happens in humans where they have limited resources, right? And they're not able to really be there and care for the, their infants and their offspring as much because they're out working three jobs or, you know, uh, just trying to, trying to maintain. So here you can see a uh, picture of the behavior of the moms and the nest. So here's the nest and here is the food. And in the control subjects, they, you know, go back to the food, walk around a little bit, but mostly spend a lot of time on the nest and there's not a whole lot of hunting around. Here in the limited bedding paradigm, there's a whole lot of exploration of the cage, running around, looking for nesting material, uh, and the, the uh, departures, as you can see here, are elevated. The nest departures are elevated in this group. And uh, it's been previously found that uh, serum corticosterone is elevated both at P12 during this, uh, or just after this uh, paradigm, and then a little bit later in development as well. And that uh, growth, the growth curve, the weight gain over time in these animals is reduced. And the amount of time that they're able or perhaps willing to hang on a wire is also reduced in these animals. 
so we're looking at mitochondrial gene expression. We know we have this nice stress paradigm and we have DNA uh, or cDNA from the um, hippocampus. And so we can look at gene expression in these animals at a variety of periods, both during the stress exposure, immediately following the stress exposure, and then during adolescence and into adulthood. And we're looking at those 13 protein coding mitochondrial genes that I told you about that are critical to the mitochondrial respiratory chain where you produce ATP, the energy needed for cells. And what you see here are those 13 genes. And you can see that there's an age effect for every one of them, that mitochondrial gene expression in the hippocampus increases over development in these animals. There are some significant main effects of group and a number of trend effects. Um, and then there are a large number of these genes have an age by early stress interaction such that the normal increase in mitochondrial gene expression that occurs across development is substantially lower in those with early stress. This is that mitochondrial genome that I told you about and here you can see the various genes that are reduced um, over time in development with this early stress group. So uh, here's a little summary and of course you know the question then is well what are the mechanisms of these effects? Um, possibly an increase in ROS generation uh, and associated mutations and deletions. As I told you, mitochondria and telomeres are very sensitive to the effects of reactive oxygen species. Um, there may be epigenetic alterations, as I mentioned earlier. We're wondering what, because of our studies in humans, our findings in humans, we're wondering what the relationship is to mtDNA copy number. So we're looking at that next. Um, and we're also very interested in mitochondrial function, you know, so if there's changes in mitochondria, uh, in mitochondrial biogenesis, mitochondrial proliferation, gene expression, what's happening in terms of the actual function, the bioenergetic function of mitochondria? So we're looking at that now. Okay, now <laughs> this is another study that I'm going to quickly run you through. Um, this is a study of a mixed race group of impoverished, maltreated preschool age children that we started about um, seven years ago or so. And uh, we've, we're just starting this summer a follow-up study of them that I'll tell you a bit about. So children were age three to five. Um, half of them had documented evidence of maltreatment through our child protective services. The other half um, were demographically matched and they were by and large impoverished, but they had not had uh, evidence of childhood maltreatment. Although they certainly had some other forms of adversity or some of them did. And that was compared to this non-maltreated group, as I said. These were recruited from a low-income clinic and child care centers, um, and they had no record of maltreatment. And we studied them in the home because it's easier to, to engage them in the home. As I said, these families are impoverished, very difficult to study them. We often you know, reschedule appointments multiple times and come, come by the house, study them in their homes. Uh, we do interviews and questionnaires. Uh, we measure a variety of adverse life experiences because we know in addition to maltreatment, there are other problems that they've had, many other problems. Uh, we uh, sampled saliva for cortisol and we, we did a little bit of uh, IL-6 and um, uh, w w the, the trouble that we had here was that these are very young children it's hard to get them to produce samples and so um, we, we were limited in terms of what we could assay there. Uh, and we got saliva DNA. And from there, we looked at some candidate genes. We have an exome array that we're looking at, We've done some gene methylation. And what I'm going to show you today is the telomere work and the mitochondrial DNA copy number. We have a six-month follow-up as well that I will show you. So these data are hot off the presses. I made the figure yesterday. Um, this is baseline and follow-up, baseline and follow-up. This is telomere length, empty DNA copy number, and in red is the maltreatment group. So, surprise, and these are 117 and 130. The ends change slightly depending on the measure. Um, surprisingly, and these are significant effects in each case, telomere length was longer in the maltreatment group 
and yet mtDNA copy number was higher. So uh, that's surprising because, as I so showed you earlier, we just did a meta-analysis showing this modest significant effect of shorter telomeres with early stress. Um, I'm not sure what to make of it yet. Um, you know, possible there's a compensatory response, possible telomerase effect. Unfortunately, we don't have data on that. But it is encouraging to see that it's consistent with the mtDNA copy number effects. And um, I'll show you some behavioral effects as well that, that uh, make us uh, believe that, that this effect is real. So um, here we have the other stressors, uh, socioeconomic status composite, past month stress, past six months stress, and these are things like moves, uh, incarceration, food insecurity, things like this. Um, lifetime stress and a, an adversity composite where we combine these various variables. And what you can see is that there is a positive correlation of mitochondria baseline and follow-up and telomere length at baseline and follow-up with a variety of these other stressors. And here is a, the correlation with psychiatric symptoms. So mitochondrial DNA copy number at baseline and follow-up, telomere length at baseline and follow-up. Uh, we did the DIPA interview with the parents and also the CBCL self-report with the parents. We did not have a lot of, at age three to five, a lot of kids actually meeting diagnos diagnostic criteria. We had some with symptoms, but um, the DIPA wasn't the best measure for us because there wasn't enough variability across the whole sample. So in general, our findings with the CBCL have been better because it's more normally distributed. Um, but you do see an effect of PTSD symptoms with telomere length, internalizing behavior across the various measures, externalizing behavior with telomeres at baseline, uh, and these are, sorry, baseline symptoms, and here we have follow-up symptoms with, again, significant effects of internalizing behavior, uh, separation anxiety as well. Okay, so now I'm just going to tell you about two new studies without any data yet, but just to let you know what our group is doing and how we're addressing some of the limitations of some of the previous work. So this is the LIFE study. It's an ongoing study of adults age 18 to 40. It's similar in some ways to the endophenotype study, but the participants are younger. Um, which we hope means that they'll be more at risk rather than resilient. Um, and we studied those with a history of parental loss plus neglect by the remaining caregiver. Most of them also have abuse, and this is an ongoing study, but I'd say about 80% also have uh, childhood abuse in addition to neglect and loss. And then controls with no history of loss, maltreatment, or psychopathology. Um, uh, adversity is assessed with the uh, childhood experience of care and abuse uh, interview. It's a very extensive interview, so we will have a lot of data to get at the questions of uh, the type and timing and chronicity of various adversity factors, if we can ever figure out uh, how, to, how to parse all of the uh, interacting um, factors there. Uh, so I mentioned this, we also have the SCID, we have a variety of questionnaires spanning uh, adversity and health uh, behaviors and uh, many things that, that uh, you all would be interested in. Uh, we've got biological specimens including a fasting blood draw, our previous work was not fasting. Um, and we're isolating PBMCs. We'll be looking at the methylome and at glucocorticoid and inflammatory signaling pathways there. Um, we'll be looking at telomeres and mtDNA copy number, as well as uh, measures of glucose regulation, uh, cytokines, adipokines, and we're also looking at mitochondrial function in these participants. We're doing the TSST and the low-dose dexamethasone test, uh, as well as looking in vitro in the lab at glucocorticoid receptor sensitivity. So recall that previously I said, well, you know, we surmise that with lower levels of methylation, you would have, in this case, we'll have that, and we, I didn't know if I said it here, but we'll also have gene expression to be able to assess what's really happening in response to methylation. Next question. So, um, does the fasting blood draw give you cleaner measure? Mm. Um, what's the, like, what was, what was the reason you Right, well, so, yes, um, yes. So, uh, 
you know, a variety of things can alter the systems that we're interested in, uh, inclu certainly including food intake. So we've always been careful to, you know, pay attention to diurnal rhythms and carefully time the tests that we're doing and record food intake and we try not to have our tests near a meal. But in this case, we said, you know what, let's do an over, uh, overnight fast because, yes, absolutely, um, endocrine, inflammatory, and metabolic processes are influenced by food intake. Yeah. And, um, what is the ethnicity? Excuse me? What is the ethnicity? Uh, it's a mixed ethnicity uh, mirroring the population of Rhode Island, which is mostly white, unfortunately. Okay. As, I'm, as I mentioned, the child sample that we have is a much more mixed group. Yeah. Um, that's an excellent question. We did not have enough uh, to really answer that question in the larger adult sample, um, but overall we did not, you know, in what we had. In the kids, um, as I said, we just looked at these data. I think there may be a Hispanic ethnicity effect there, and we did control for any uh, demographic factors that were significant. Um, but I'm hesitant to say more about that since we have to look at it more closely. Excellent question. Uh, okay, so these are the things we're interested in, and we've also uh, added hair cortisol, and we're storing stool samples for some future date when we might uh, have the ability to look at the microbiome. And this is our new uh, kids marker study. This is the follow-up to our maltreated preschooler study. We're just starting it this summer. We're studying these kids in a summer camp setting. So it's a week-long day camp where they come and they get to have a camp experience. None of these kids have ever actually been swimming. So we're happy to be able to give back to them after all these years of bugging them, saying, well, you continue to allow us to study you. Um, and this is on you know a couple hundred acres in the woods uh, with a lake and uh, they'll have access to usual camp activities um, and then we'll also have a uh, structured controlled setting in which to study them they'll participate in about one hour a day of uh, research assessments um, and we'll also have a home visit in the month before the camp uh, we will query their physicians regarding their health history and their medications so we're interested in appreciating you know these kids were maltreated early on what has happened to them since both in terms of adversity social support interventions um, as well as what has happened have they developed illnesses they were healthy when they started out they were not taking medications and they were healthy so what has happened in terms of the development of uh, health problems like obesity uh, and other conditions uh, we'll be doing parent interviews and questionnaires. We'll be assessing dietary intake over three days, physical inactivity over uh, one week, uh, we're doing actigraphy, assessing illnesses and medications. And in the camp, we'll be doing, of course, uh, extensive interviews, cognitive tests and EEG. We'll be looking at pulmonary function tests, flow-mediated dilatation. This is a measure of endothelial function where you actually use ultrasound to look at the brachial artery. And then you have a uh, blood pressure cuff inflated for uh, five minutes and then you reduce the cuff and you assess what happens in the brachial artery. Is, is it able to expand uh, appropriately? Are the arti uh, arteries elastic enough? Um, We'll be doing indirect calorimetry to assess the uh, children's metabolic rate, uh, body composition analysis and anthropometrics, and we'll be uh, measuring various substances in blood, including uh, cortisol, glucose and insulin, cytokines, adipokines, telomeres, mtDNA copy number. Um, we're also looking at mitochondrial enzymes and mitochondrial function. And in addition, we're adding in uh, the hair sample and, the, and we hope to get a stool sample some one of the days at the camp uh, to have that for the future for microbiome work.
So this is my last slide. This is just to uh, remind people that, you know, in this country when we say everyone has an equal opportunity and people should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that, you know, when you have these kinds of experiences that really ch fundamentally change your biology and put you at risk, you know, not only for, you know, health behaviors that get people into trouble, but also um, our, our uh, mechanisms of these uh, health conditions, you can't really just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators, Catherine and Sam Rideout, uh, some students, graduate student, and uh, faculty collaborators at Brown who have been instrumental to this work. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Yeah. In the follow-up marker study, what are you, what measures are you using to look at adversity in the intervening years. I saw that you had the welfare records. Where are you doing any additional questions? Yes. Um, yes, so we will be, you know, carefully analyzing the uh, child welfare records. And then we've developed a number of measures. We call them sort of contextual stress measures um, to get at the things that I mentioned, some of the things I mentioned earlier, like uh, the number of moves and parental incarceration. Yes? Yes. To yes, that's a great question. Uh, I neglected to say that we required that those events happen within six months. So it may have been the case, and it's for some children it was, that they had earlier events, but that they had to have happened in the last six months. So that's a, an excellent point, and, and we may see over time that uh, those effects change. Yes? Are there any ways of reversing the damage of childhood trauma? Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, well, um, uh, right, uh, it's, it's really the most important question. And in fact, we might even step back further and say, how about prevention, right? Um, so prevention, I think, is critically important. Parenting and support to these families who need it so badly. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we believe so. And there are some intervention studies um, showing that if you intervene you know, again, I guess I didn't really say this, but, uh, you know, children are entirely dependent on us for everything, right? So uh, you can't, do, as they get older, that changes some. I'm the mother of two adolescents, so I'm well aware of their independence. Um, but, you know, when they're young children, you really need to change their environment and the relationships with adults. So certainly there are some interventions that show promising results there. Um, and then I didn't include a slide here, but um, certainly this group has done a lot of work, or, or several groups here, um, looking at various lifestyle kinds of interventions that alter the effects of uh, stress on these biomarkers and these allostatic load measures. Um, so there have been some studies in relation to childhood maltreatment specifically, but I would expect that the studies in other groups will be applicable to those to those kids as well. You know, lifestyle interventions are pretty hard to do in kids. Um, you really have to do it in the families, and then when families are impoverished and stressed, I mean, we all know, probably most of us have never experienced that level of difficulty and adversity but even you know with the level of stress that we have you know you start to eat more poorly you don't go to the gym you're not sleeping all of those things so with with these families it's much more difficult but yes we we hope to uh, get there and, and develop some some really valuable interventions going forward sorry. oh sorry yes you you had your hand up before um, so in the in the finding with accumulating and the mitochondrial coffee number relationship to the in the three to five year old mm -hmm. preschoolers. Was that in salivary? Did I miss that? Salivary? Yes. So I'm thinking that in terms of the this follow up it's a blood sample collection versus the salivary accumulate. Yes. Are you are you doing salivary measures? Yes. Yeah. We are. We had been thinking we need to do that anyway. And then 
recently when we just got this, these data, it's very clear that we need to do it to look at it in saliva for sure. Now I will say that uh, that CHI study that I told you about in the uh, Converge sample did look at saliva and showed telomere shortening, and these were adults, uh, and showed telomere shortening and empty DNA copy number elevations, but um, it's different than what we see in the kids and obviously yeah, very different sample. Because, I mean, salivary measures talk to some others about this, you know, in a three to five year old, they have very active gums. Yes. Um, they're, um, so, so, the, so the population of cells that are, you're getting are really leukocytes. Right. Um, being secreted through open right. wounds in the mouth. And so I'm just thinking mm -hmm. in terms of what the cell sources are, the telomere length and the mitochondrial copy number are going to vary quite a bit depending on the cell sources. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's always a very important consideration. Um, actually, in that CHI study, they did they looked in a subsample of their participants, and they um, they employed that I think it's the Hauser technique to uh, epigenetically assess cell type distribution. So you can look at the epigenetic profile of different cell types and identify what that composition is and then control for that statistically. They did that and found that this, there wasn't much of a cell type difference between, again, this is just depression and control, so it's not the same, but they didn't see much of a difference in terms of the cell type uh, distribution, and they also did not, they, they said it was about a 10%, 10% of the effect on mtDNA and on telomere length. So it didn't appear to be a huge effect, but absolutely we are concerned about that and we'll have to look at that closely. Yes? So my question is to kind of follow up on the, on the, the in the concept, like thinking about mitochondria and telomere length in the context of psychiatric diseases. So from the CHI study, so it's increased, mitochondrial the has increased in the depressive disorder, but it's dependent on the state, if you remember correctly from the study. And so, so they, they, they were trying to make a case that it is potentially a biomarker, a state-dependent biomarker, but in an episode or not. But then, so I was wondering what your thoughts were on what is the direction of effect, and so is it, is it like a consequence of the disease, or is it something that we can use as a marker of stressful events that kind of put you in an episode, and I guess also in the context of the adversity, childhood adversity that you're seeing, like what is it that it's tagging, or is it something that's causing all these downstream effects to happen? And like what are your thoughts on like the temporal aspect of the mechanism? Yeah. Uh, that's an outstanding question, and I, I think we're really at the very beginning of this work. So uh, any of those hypotheses I, I think are reasonable, and probably it's bidirectional and multifactorial. Um, I think, uh, you know, that certainly that question has been around for quite some time with telomere shortening and major depression, and there's some evidence that uh, depression results from shortened telomeres and some evidence of the opposite, and it's probably a combination of the two. My guess is that the same may be of true for empty DNA copy number, but with, with empty DNA content, as they, Kai called it, or copy number, um, it's really a, a sort of derivative measure, and it's really not getting at you know the meat of what's going on and so you can have these compensatory changes that don't necessarily tell us what's actually happening in terms of you know mutations deletions gene expression and function so I think as we drill down to that we'll be able to get a better a better sense of it well, thank you very much Audrey. really thank great you. presentation very thoughtful innovative addressing a huge problem thank you, thank you.